Ahmad Shah Durrani. Ahmad Shah Durrani, circa 1722, October 16, 1772, Pashto, also known as Ahmad Khan Abdali, was the founder of the Durrani Empire and is regarded as the founder of the modern state of Afghanistan. He began his career by enlisting as a young soldier in the military of the Afsharid Kingdom and quickly rose to become a commander of the Abdali Regiment, a cavalry of 4,000 Abdali Pashtun soldiers. After the assassination of Nader Shah Afshar in 1747, Ahmad Shah Durrani was chosen as king of Afghanistan. Rallying his Afghan tribes and allies, he pushed east towards the Mughal and the Maratha empires of India, west towards the disintegrating Afsharid Empire of Persia and north toward the Khanate of Bukhara. Within a few years, he extended his control from Khorasan in the west to Kashmir and North India in the east, and from the Amu Darya in the north to the Arabian Sea in the south. Durrani's mausoleum is located at Kandahar, Afghanistan, adjacent to the Shrine of the Cloak and the center of the city. Afghans often refer to him as Ahmad Shah Baba, Ahmad Shah the Father. Durrani was born in or about 1722 to Muhammad Zaman Khan, chief of the Abdali tribe and governor of Herat, and Sargana Alakosi. According to the Encyclopedia of Islam and most other sources, he was born in Multan. However, according to Encyclopedia Britannica Online, there has been some debate about Durrani's exact place of birth, and they state he was either born in Multan or Herat. Durrani was born as Ahmed Khan. Abdali's father suffered Persian captivity for many years at Kirman before being released from prison in 1715. As a refugee, he made his way to India and joined his kinsmen at Multan. After he raised his family there, he was recognized as the scion of hereditary Sadozaychifs. It is believed that Zaman Khan returned to Afghanistan to fight the Persians and his Afghan rivals, but left one of his wives at Multan because she was in the family way. So other sources believe that, Abdali was born at Multan in 1722, after which he returned to Afghanistan to reunite with her husband. He lost his father during his infancy. Durrani's forefathers were Sadozais but his mother was from the Alakosai tribe. In June 1729, the Abdali forces under Zulfikar had surrendered to Nader Shah Afshar, the rising new ruler of Persia. However, they soon began a rebellion and took over Herat as well as Mashhad. In July 1730, he defeated Ibrahim Khan, a military commander and brother of Nader Shah. This prompted Nader Shah to retake Mashhad and also intervene in the power struggle of Harat. By July 1731, Zulfikar returned to his capital Farah where he had been serving as the governor since 1726. A year later, Nader's brother Ibrahim Khan took control of Farah. During this time, Zulfikar and the young Durrani fled to Kandahar where they took refuge with the Gilyas. They were later made political prisoners by Hussein Hadak, the Gilji ruler of the Kandahar region. Nader Shah had been enlisting the Abdalis in his army since around 1729. After conquering Kandahar in 1738, Durrani and his brother Zulfikar were freed and provided with leading careers in Nader Shah's administration. Zulfikar was made governor of Mazandaran while Durrani remained working as Nader Shah's personal attendant. The Gilyas, who are originally from the territories east of the Kandahar region, were expelled from Kandahar in order to resettle the Abdalis along with some Kazilbash and other Persians. Durrani proved himself in Nader Shah's service and was promoted from a personal attendant, Yasal, to command the Abdali Regiment, a cavalry of 4,000 soldiers and officers. The Abdali Regiment was part of Nader Shah's military during his invasion of the Mughal Empire in 1738. Popular history has it that the Shah could see the talent in his young commander. Later on, according to Pashtun legend, it is said that in Delhi Nader Shah summoned Durrani, and said, Come forward Ahmad Abdali. Remember Ahmad Khan Abdali, that after me the kingship will pass on to you. Nader Shah recruited him because of his impressive personality and valor, also because of his loyalty to the Persian monarch. Nader Shah's rule abruptly ended in June 1747 when he was assassinated by his own guards. The guards involved in the assassination did so secretly so as to prevent the Abdalis from coming to their king's rescue. However, Durrani was told that the Shah had been killed by one of his wives. Despite the danger of being attacked, the Abdali contingent led by Durrani rushed either to save the Shah or to confirm what happened. Upon reaching the Shah's tent, they were only to see his body and severed head. Having served him so loyally, the Abdalis wept at having failed their leader, and headed back to Kandahar. Before the retreat to Kandahar, he had removed the royal seal from Nader Shah's finger and the Kohinoor diamond tied around the arm of his deceased master. On their way back to Kandahar, 
the Abdalis had unanimously accepted Durrani as their new leader. Hence, he assumed the insignia of royalty as the sovereign ruler of Afghanistan. One of Durrani's first acts as chief was to adopt the titles Badisha I Ghazi, victorious emperor, and Durai Durrani, Pearl of Pearls or Pearl of Theage. Following his predecessor, Durrani set up a special force closest to him, consisting mostly of his fellow Durranis and other Pashtuns, as well as Tajiks, Kazilbash, and other Muslims. He began his military conquest by capturing Ghazni from the Gilius and then wresting Kabul from the local ruler, and thus strengthened his hold over Khorasan. Leadership of the various Afghan tribes rested mainly on the ability to provide booty for the clan, and Durrani proved remarkably successful in providing both booty and occupation for his followers. Apart from invading the Punjab region three times between the years 1747 to 1753, he captured Herat in 1750. Abdali invaded the Mughal Empire seven times from 1748 to 1767. According to Jaswant Lal Mehta, Durrani aroused the Afghans' religious passions to fire on sword into the land of infidels India. He crossed the Khyber Pass in December 1747 with 40,000 troops for his first invasion of India. He occupied Peshawar without any opposition. He first crossed the Indus River in 1748, the year after his ascension. His forces sacked and absorbed Lahore. The following year, 1749, the Mughal ruler was induced to cede Sindh and all of the Punjab, including the vital Trans Indus River, to him, in order to save his capital from being attacked by the forces of the Durrani Empire. Having thus gained substantial territories to the east without a fight, Durrani and his forces turned westward to take possession of Herat, which was ruled by Nader Shah's grandson, Shah Rukh. The city fell to the Afghans in 1750. After almost a year of siege and bloody conflict, the Afghan forces then pushed on into present-day Iran, capturing Nishapur and Mashhad in 1751. Durrani then pardoned Shah Rukh and reconstituted Khorasan, but a tributary of the Durrani Empire. This marked the westernmost border of the Afghan Empire as set by the Pulai Abrisham, on the Mashhad Tehran Road. The Mughal power in northern India had been declining since the reign of Aurangzeb, who died in 1707. In 1751-52, the Ahamdiya Treaty was signed between the Marathas and Mughals, when Balaji Baja Rao was the Peshwa of the Maratha Empire. Through this treaty, the Marathas controlled large parts of India from their capital at Pune and Mughal rule was restricted only to Delhi, Mughals remained the nominal heads of Delhi. Marathas were now straining to expand their area of control towards the northwest of India. Durrani sacked the Mughal capital and withdrew with the booty he coveted. To counter the Afghans, Peshwa Balaji Baja Rao sent Raghun Athrao. He succeeded in ousting Timur Shah and his court from India and brought northwest of India up to Peshawar under Maratha rule. Thus, upon his return to Kandahar in 1757, Durrani chose to return to India and confront the Maratha forces to regain northwestern part of the subcontinent. In 1761, Durrani set out on his campaign to win back lost territories. The early skirmishes ended in victory for the Afghans against the Maratha garrisons in northwest India. By 1759, Durrani and his army had reached Lahore and were poised to confront the Marathas. By 1760, the Maratha groups had coalesced into a big enough army under the command of Sadashiv Ropal. Once again, Panipat was the scene of a battle for control of northern India. The third battle of Panipat was fought between Durrani's Afghan forces and the Maratha forces in January 1761, and resulted in a decisive Durrani victory. This brought Punjab till north of Sutlej River under Afghan control. Ahmad Shah Durrani vacated Delhi soon after the battle. The historical area of what is modern-day Xinjiang consisted of the distinct areas of the Tarim Basin and Jung area, and was originally populated by Indo-European Tocharian and Eastern Iranian Saka peoples who practiced the Buddhist religion. The area was subjected to Turkification and Islamification at the hands of invading Turkic Muslims. Both the Buddhist Turkic Uyghurs and Muslim Turkic Karluks participated in the Turkification and conquest of the native Buddhist Indo-European inhabitants of the Tarim Basin. The Turkic Muslims then proceeded to conquer the Turkic Buddhists in Islamic holy wars and converted theme to Islam. The mixture between the invading Mongoloid Turkic peoples and the native Caucasian Indo-European inhabitants resulted in the modern-day Turkic-speaking hybrid Europoid East Asian inhabitants of Xinjiang. The Turkification was carried out in the 9th and 10th centuries by two different Turkic kingdoms, the Buddhist Uyghur Kingdom of Kocho and the Muslim Karlik Karakhanid Khanate. Halfway in the 20th century the Saka Iranic Buddhist Kingdom of Khotang came under attack by the Turkic Muslim Karakhanid ruler Musa, 
and in what proved to be a pivotal moment in the Turkification and Islamification of the Tarim Basin, the Karakana leader Yusuf Qadir Khan conquered Khotan around 1006. Professor James A. Millward described the original Uyghurs as physically mongoloid, giving as an example the images in Baziklik at Temple 9 of the Uyghur patrons, until they began to mix with the Tarim Basin's original eastern Iranian inhabitants. The modern Uyghurs are now a mixed hybrid of East Asian and Europoid populations. The Turkic Muslim sedentary people of the Tarim Basin of Altishar were originally ruled by the Shagatai Khanate while the nomadic Buddhist Jungar Oiritsi in Jungaria ruled over the Jungar Khanate. The Naqshbandi Sufi coaches, descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, had replaced the Shagatai Khans as ruling authority of the Tarim Basin in the early 17th century. There was a struggle between two factions of coaches, the Afaki, White Mountain, faction and the Ishaki, Black Mountain, faction. The Ishaki defeated the Afaki, which resulted in the Afaki Koja inviting the fifth Dalai Lama, the leader of the Tibetan Buddhists, to intervene on his behalf in 1677. The fifth Dalai Lama then called upon his Jungar Buddhist followers in the Dzunghar Khanate to act on this invitation. The Jungar Khanate then conquered the Tarim Basin in 1680, setting up the Afaki Koja as their puppet ruler. Koja Fak asked the 5th Dalai Lama when he fled to Lhasa to help his Afaki faction take control of the Tarim Basin, Kashgaria. The Jungar leader Galdan was then asked by the Dalai Lama to restore Koja Fak as ruler of Kashgaria. Koja Fak collaborated with Galdan's Jungars when the Jungars conquered the Tarim Basin from 1678 to 1680 and set up the Afaki Kojas as puppet client rulers. The Dalai Lama blessed Galdan's conquest off the Tarim Basin and Turfan Basin. Since 1680 the Jungars had ruled as suzerain masters over the Tarim, for 16 more years using the Shagatai as their puppet rulers. The Jungars used a hostage arrangement to rule over the Tarim Basin, keeping as hostages and Ili either the sons of the leaders like the Kojas and consort leaders themselves. Although the Uyghurs' culture and religion was left alone, the Jungars substantially exploited them economically. The Uyghurs were forced with multiple taxes by the Jungars which were burdensome and set by a determined amount, and which they did not even have the ability to pay. They included water conservancy tax, draft animal tax, fruit tax, poll tax, land tax, tress and grass tax, gold and silver tax, and trade tax. Annually the Jungars extracted a tax of 67,000 tangas of silver from the Kashgar people in Golden Saren's reign. A 5% tax was imposed on foreign traders and a 10% tax imposed on Muslim merchants. People had to pay a fruit tax if they owned orchards and merchants had to pay a copper on silver tax. Annually the Jungars extracted 100,000 silver tangas in tax from Yarkand and Slap livestock, stain, commerce, and a gold tax on them. The Jungars extracted 700 tails of gold and also extracted cotton, copper, and cloth, from the six regions of Karia, Kashgar, Khotan, Kucha, Yarkand, and Aksu as stated by Russian topographer Yakov Filosov. The Jungars extracted over 50% of the wheat harvests of Muslims according to Chiyishi, Chunyuan, 30-40% of the wheat harvests of Muslims according to the Shu Tuzi, which labeled the tax as plunder of the Muslims. The Jungars also extorted extra taxes on cotton, silver, gold and traded goods from the Muslims besides making them pay the official tax. Wine, meat, and women in a parting gift were forcibly extracted from the Uyghurs daily by the Jungars who went to physically gather the taxes from the Uyghur Muslims, and if they dissatisfied with what they received, they would rape women, and loot and steal property and livestock. Gold necklaces, diamonds, pearls, and precious stones from India were extracted from the Uyghurs under Danyal Koja by Zwang Rabton when his daughter was getting married. 67,000 patmen, each patmen is 4 pickles and 5 pecks, of grain 48,000 silver ounces were forced to be paid yearly by Kashgar to the Jungars and cash was also paid by the rest of the cities to the Jungars. Trade, milling, and distilling taxes, corvée labor, saffron, cotton, and grain were also extracted by the Jungars from the Tarim Basin. Every harvest season, women and food had to be provided to Jungars when they came to extract the taxes from them. When the Jungars levied the traditional nomadic Alban pull tax upon the Muslims of Al-Tishar, the Muslims viewed it as the payment of jizya, a tax traditionally taken from non-Muslims by Muslim conquerors. The Qing defeat of the Jungars went hand-in-hand hand with the anti-Jungar resistance of the ordinary Uyghurs, many of them, unable to bear their misery, which was like living in a sea of fire, fled but were not able to find a place to settle peacefully. 
The Uyghurs carried out acts of resistance like hiding the goods which were collected as taxes or violently resisting the Junger Oira tax collectors, but these incidents were infrequent and widespread anti-Junger opposition failed to materialize. Many opponents of Junger rule like Uyghurs and some dissident Jungers escaped and defected to Qing China during 1737-1754 and provided the Qing with intelligence on the Jungers and voiced their grievances. Abdullah Tarkin Beg and his Hami Uyghurs defected and submitted to Qing China after the Qing inflicted a devastating defeat at Jalmodu on the Junger leader Galdan in September 1696. The Uyghur leader Amin Koja, Amin Koja of Turfan revolted against the Jungers in 1720 while the Jungers under Zhuang Rapton were being attacked by the Qing, and then he also defected and submitted to the Qing. The Uyghurs in Kashgar under Yusuf and his older brother Jahan Koja of Yarkand revolted in 1754 against the Jungers, but Jahan was taken prisoner by the Jungers after he was betrayed by the Uch Turfan Uyghurs I Boke Koja and Aksu Uyghur Ayub Koja. Kashgar and Yarkand were assaulted by 7,000 Khotan Uyghurs under Sadiq, the son of Jahan Koja. The Uyghurs supported the 1755 Qing assault against the Jungers in Ili, which occurred at the same time as the Uyghur revolts against the Jungers. Uyghurs like Emin Koja, Abdul Mumin and Yusuf Beg supported the Qing attack against Da Achi, the Junger Khan. The Uch Turfan New Uyghur and Beg Kojis, Ha Ojizi, supported the Qing general Bondi against and tricking Devakian taking him prisoner. The Qing and Amin Koja and his sons worked together to defeat the Jungers under Amorsana. From the 17th century to the middle of the 18th century, between China proper and Transoxania, all the land was under the sway of the Jungers. In Semirishi, the Kyrgyz and Kazakhs were forcibly driven out by the Jungers and the Kashgar Khanate was conquered. However, the Junger Empire was annihilated by Qing China from 1755 to 1758 in a formidable assault, ending the Central Asian state's danger from the Jungar menace. Weaker Muslims like Emin Koja from Turfan revolted against their Junger Buddhist rulers and pledged allegiance to Qing China to deliver them from Junger Buddhist rule. The Qing crushed and annihilated the Jungers in the Junger Genocide. The Junger Buddhists brought back the Aktaklik of Faki Koja Burhanuddin and his brother Khan Koja and installed them as puppet rulers in Kashgar. During the Qing's war against the Jungers, Burhanuddin and his brother Khan Koja then pledged allegiance to Qing China in exchange for delivering theme from Junger rule. However, after the Qing defeated the Jungers, the Afaki Koja brothers Burhanuddin and Khan Koja reneged on the deal with the Qing declared independence and revolted against the Qing. The Qing and loyal Uyghurs like Emin Koja crushed the revolt and drove Burhanuddin and Khan Koja to Badakhshan. The Qing armies reached far in Central Asia and came to the outskirts of Tashkent while the Kazakh rulers made their submissions as vassals to the Qing. The Afaki brothers died in Badakhshan and the ruler Sultan Shah delivered their bodies to the Qing. Ahmad Shah Durrani accused Sultan Shah of having caused the Afaki brothers to die. Durrani dispatched troops to Kokand after rumors that the Qing dynasty planned to launch an expedition to Samarkand, but the alleged expedition never happened and Ahmad Shah subsequently withdrew his forces when his attempt at an anti-Qing alliance among Central Asian states failed. Durrani then sent envoys to Beijing to discuss the situation regarding the Afaki Kojas. During the Third Battle of Panipat between Marathas and Durrani, the Sikhs did not engage along with the Marathas and hence are considered neutral in the war. This was because of the flawed diplomacy on the part of Marathas in not recognizing their strategic potential. The exception was Allah Singh of Patiala, who sided with the Afghans and was actually being granted and coincidentally crowned the first Sikh Maharaja at the Sikh Holy Temple. Durrani died on October 16, 1772 in Kandahar province. He was buried in the city of Kandahar adjacent to the Shrine of the Cloak where a large tomb was built. It has been described in the following way in his tomb his epitaph is written Durrani's victory over the Marathas influenced the history of the subcontinent and, in particular, British policy in the region. His refusal to continue his campaigns deeper into India prevented a clash with the East India Company and allowed them to continue to acquire power and influence after they took complete control of the former Mughal province of Bengal in 1793. However, Fear of another Afghan invasion was to haunt British policy for almost half a century after the Battle of Panipat. The acknowledgement of Abdali's military accomplishments is reflected in a British intelligence report in the Battle of Panipat, which referred to Ahmad Shah as the King of Kings. 
This fear led in 1798 to a British envoy being sent to the Persian court in Purdue to instigate the Persians in their claims on Herat to forestall an Afghan invasion of India that might have halted British East India Company's expansion. Mount Stuart Elphinstone wrote of Ahmad Shah his successors, beginning with his son Timur and ending with Shuja Shah Durrani, proved largely incapable of governing the last Afghan empire and faced with advancing enemies on all sides. Much of the territory conquered by Ahmad Shah fell to others by the end of the 19th century. They not only lost the outlying territories but also alienated some Pashtun tribes and those of other Durrani lineages. Until Dust Muhammad Khan's ascendancy in 1826, chaos reigned in Afghanistan, which effectively ceased to exist as a single entity, disintegrating into a fragmented collection of small countries or units. This policy ensured that he did not continue on the path of other conquerors like Babur or Muhammad of Ghor and make India the base for his empire. In Pakistan, a short-range ballistic missile Abdali I, is named in the honor of Ahmad Shah Abdali. Durrani wrote a collection of odes in his native Pashto language. He was also the author of several poems in Persian. The most famous Pashto poem he wrote was Love of a Nation. During Nader Shah's invasion of India in 1739, Abdali also accompanied him and stayed some days in the Red Fort of Delhi. When he was standing outside the Jolly Gate near Divan I am, Asaf Jah I saw him. He was an expert in physiognomy and predicted that Abdali was destined to become a king. When Nader Shah came to know about it, he purportedly clipped his ears with his dagger and made the remark when you become a king, this will remind you of me. According to other sources, Nader Shah did not believe in it and asked him to be kind to his descendants on the attainment of royalty. Alakuzai, Hamid Wad, A Concise History of Afghanistan in 25 Volumes, USA, 2013, Vo 14, page 62, SC. E. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.